Good evening, everyone. It's really wonderful to have you all here at the Bits Business School. Of course, a subject like uh, the World Economic Forum and the, the annual meeting at Davos fits in very, uh, very clearly with the business objectives of the Fitz Business School. What we have, one of our key uh, deliverables is to provide relevant debate on topics that are of interest to the business community in South Africa and Africa and beyond. What is the WEF? What is the World Economic Forum? It was started 46 years ago, 1971. I had my first trip there in 1993, immediately after Nelson Mandela, F.W. de Klerk and Mabasu uh, Tukutelezi shared a stage for the first time on the same podium. <coughs> what happened there was fascinating. Mandela arrived uh, with a nationalization agenda. Uh, the people from the West tried to change his mind. He didn't listen. And then he met him. The, a hero of his, a Viet Cong general, who explained to him that nationalization was crazy, it was almost a plot to keep down the former socialist countries, and in fact you've got to embrace the market economy. So Madiba came back to South Africa, embraced the market economy, and the rest is kind of history. South Africa, at the WEF in 2016, in my 13 years, it's never been as bad. Uh, it started off with a Swiss newspaper article, and this Swiss newspaper had a full page which it termed a toxic president no guesses for who they were talking about. Then the International Monetary Fund updated its um, GDP forecasts. In October last year, it had a figure of 1.3% for South Africa. In uh, January this year, post Nenegate, what happened in December, that number has now been dropped to 0.7%. So if you think it was a storm in a teacup, the Van Royen episode, ask the IMF. It wasn't a very good uh, year for South Africa, probably summed up by Gideon Ruchman. Those of you who read the Financial Times of London will know he's one of the most influential columnists. And uh, he said that when he was last in South Africa, uh, the negativity that, that, uh, that, was, that existed in the country uh, around particularly the president and some of the things that were happening uh, has now spread into the international community. And it was very much so. Um, of course, you have to expect. Uh, brand South Africa to put a bright face on it. The reality was everywhere I went, um, people were very concerned about what's happening in our country. What happens at the WEF is that you get trends that are happening around the world that get raised there, kind of bubbling under. Al Gore started global warming long before an inconvenient truth. As far as the fourth industrial revolution is concerned, though, this is something that we aren't too badly off because we have participated in the first three. Half of humanity hasn't. Half of humanity hasn't got to the third industrial revolution. So we're not too badly positioned there. And then we had the United States. The vice president was there this year, um, Joe Biden, um, explaining how 47% of the jobs in the United States will be wiped out by the fourth industrial revolution, which is uh, ubiquitous internet, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, etc., etc. I'm sure we'll get into that in more details. And finally, uh, Provin Gordon was extremely impressive. He was the only member of the South African government delegation with any visibility whatsoever. So there's a significant number of us in the ANC who want to restore integrity. Um, he says there's tough reforms that are required in education and the skills area. We need to create co-investments with public-private partnership. This is, has indeed been followed through. As uh, you may be aware, on Friday there was a meeting with 60 business leaders and Robin Gordon where he has said to the business community, we need to tackle this thing together. If you look at the, at the, at the credit rating, why is it so important? Well, if you lose investment grade, many, many uh, pension funds and financial services companies around the world literally have to sell your bonds. <laughs> you, were, you were in, you were in Davos, uh, or rather you got together with the WEF guys in August where you were given uh, uh, some background by Klaus Schwab himself about this new book that he wrote called The Fourth Industrial Revolution, on which the whole of Davos this year was themed. Just give us some background of what we're talking about. And really the Fourth Industrial Revolution is broken down into the four stages. It's the fourth uh, part of that. Leg one is the famous industrial revolution we all know about. Um, coal, steam, uh, really an uptick uh, in production uh, worldwide. And then we leapfrog into the 1960s, as he puts it through in the book, of really the microchip and the advent of uh, technology and computers, where we really start seeing uh, our productivity reach new levels, our ability to process and grow. 
and then we emerge into the fourth industrial revolution, which is really, if you see that, 1760, 1860, 1960, the question is by 2060, 2070, where will, where will we be? But we see the factors that are coming together that's really causing a disruption. And very quickly, some factors. As an example, um, you know, a research paper reveals that um, for all uh, publicly listed US companies, the mortality uh, within a five-year period is 33% of companies at the moment. For those uh, businesses that have uh, revenues above $600 million, it's 20%. So you can see the disruptive forces that are Im even in the strongest of economies that it is no longer, as Schwab says, of uh, the big eating the small. It is the fast uh, beating the slow. And that really is what the uh, fourth industrial revolution is about, a confluence of factors, be it nanotechnology, 3D printing, but all kind of, like all postmodern modern, uh, uh, kind of takes on the world of a confluence, it really is a challenge to the rest of the world, those that seem to be better equipped for it and those that seem to be lagging behind on how to prepare ourselves in this new paradigm or ecosystem. So this, this idea of automation and uh, robots entering society is really something that's picking up pace. In fact, be it Japan, be it the Nordic countries, even in the homes, uh, it's become commonplace and is permeating it. But this simplification of looking at the world through the lens of the space odyssey, you know, movies we all grew up with, is, not, is, is nothing new. It's just the reality of what's taking place. So there's a lot about exponential growth that takes place in it lies both the challenge to those economies, societies, and structures that are falling behind, but also the opportunity for leapfrogging to take part of them. And that's a word that in Africa we have, we have used loosely, I think, and we have to think through how we fit in into this new system. Now, what's interesting is it is not just the emerging markets that are grappling with this. Clearly, markets across the world uh, are battling to how they come to terms with it. And we all want the same things. Better life for our people, uh, uh, uplifting, and how technology can be an enhancement. I think the challenge for a country like South Africa is how do we adapt as people and in terms of the skills that we require. Um, we mentioned job losses, we mentioned uh, changes and challenges and so on. And the interesting thing is that the kind of skills that an economy like that requires is very different to what we are used to. Um, you might, and there are some, some overlaps, you might, you, you might need your, your engineer still, but um, they might have to adjust very quickly and adapt very quickly. So it's about your ability to take that skill that you have, and, and maybe the traditional skill, and adapt this to, to this environment. Are we able, as a society, and as human beings, and as South Africa, um, able to respond to the challenges in terms of the different skills that we need in, a, in an environment like that. Joe Biden, uh, in his talk, he was saying that America, because they've got 47% of their jobs that are going to be wiped out by the robots, by artificial intelligence, is looking to become, once again, one word, possibility. Eric, South Africa, can we call ourselves, you know, we know we're the land of opportunity, but can we also be possibility? I don't want the structural, so it's a mismatch between the skills that we are asking for and the skills we don't have. So I think uh, this fourth uh, industrial revolution can just uh, make things far worse. We are trying to face a multi-cycle downturn. That's a cycle, this is a structural change. So I'm, uh, I'm quite worried about that threat. In many ways, this global storm that has hit the world has done several things. Number one, it is a global restructuring of the way society is interconnecting with one another. Very clearly at Oxfam, at Davos, they put forward the famous statistic that X percent of the world, the top 65, 62, 62 and three and a half billion. Yeah. Three and a half billion. So this problem, this problem of this divide spreading is important. So the fourth industrial revolution is very much connected to see how we can close the gap, because success globally is in folks being lifted. Now, as someone from the financial services sector, this is what I do as a business person, enlightened self-interest would also dictate that a healthier society is a society in which people have employment. They have the dignity of, 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 of what most people want. In very simple business terms, this is the, the situation we find ourselves in is very much like the situation a number of other countries have 
We're competing globally for international investment. We are competing to create jobs for our people. We are competing to share resources in a society that has gone through massive transitions. Yeah. We have a strong financial services sector, number one. We are a connected economy. We put forward this gateway to Africa. We are structurally at an advantage to put that through. So we do have a lot at our disposal, but it is going to be challenging. Right. So the numbers today is we need 7 to 8 percent. We can debate what that is of growth to really get us going. When last did we have that? <laughs> when last has anyone in the world had that? Uh, India has it at the moment. So, so India, you five. picked one. How many China. countries in the world have it? 254. Uh, I'm questioning the sample size. China, 7 percent. 7 percent as well. Right? I'm not making excuses for South Africa Inc. by no means, so no, no am I voting anything. However, this isn't an issue of business and government. If you're a committed African, South African, it's not even an issue of South Africa. It's a regional issue that we're in this together to better educate, to better bring health care, to use, to use what we have. And so the discussion is tangible steps of which we can get this, and it's not going to be easy. The president of Korea, President Park, again, very short lady, <laughs> said that two years ago in Korea, they started realizing that jobs are changing and they've begun the creative economy. And you talk about devil in the detail and the reality. In Korea, if you're an entrepreneur and you fail, provided you didn't defraud anybody, your credit record is cleaned so that you can start again. The entrepreneurial um, development is something that is seen around the world, certainly seen in Davos, as the only thing that's going to rescue this. The old days of, of industrial revolution employment, you know, creating jobs. Think of a 3D printer. How is a 3D printer going to change manufacturing? Yeah, yeah so I'm worried about, especially the SA economy, where we have, uh, as I said, we have a, a severe skill shortage. Uh, if we get a replacement of uh, medium skills or lower level skills jobs by automation, robots and so on, that's going to make uh, the existing issues even worse. That we, we tended to sit a little bit on the sideline and, and play the, the blame game. It's time for us to get involved. It's much more than sitting on the sideline. It's shipping out capital as rapidly as possible. South African balance sheets have got 500 billion in yes. cash. It's about rebuilding. Yes, I think it's not in reinvesting in its own country. So how can we expect other uh, countries to do it? Exactly. That's exactly. It's about rebuilding trust in South Africa. South Africa's GDP per capita which is what the World Bank is using as a, as a good measure. In 2008, I don't know if they picked that because it coincides with the current administration, $8, was 17.7% of the G20's GDP per capita. This year, it's dropped to 16.1%, and they projected in 2020 to go to 14.7%. So what they're saying is not to be, it, it, it's, that we're going backwards, in other words. We have to get it right in terms of the budget. There's no room for error. We have to do something about public debt, which, to sort of give you a similar statistic, it went up from uh, about 26 to 50 percent of GDP since 2009. So that also went backwards. So there's no room for error. There's no room to do, in a way, to do anything else in the right thing. You know, more needs to be done to kickstart to kickstart this engine. And no crisis, as you've often said as well. Should go to you know should go to waste. So other economies worldwide are using this moment in time, some faster than others, to rekit and retool. And if you understand the mindset of Schwab and other big entities of putting out these things like the fourth industrial revolution, it really is a, a bell sound to the rest of the world to say, come on guys, uh, you have to get in order. So very briefly, <coughs> if I have to say in South Africa, um, what are some of the things we can do? Clearly the meeting on Friday between business and government hosted by the Minister of Finance is clearly a massive step in the right direction where this current situation globally, regionally, is pushing people together to say how can we come up with mutual solutions. So very quickly, you have to find a set of short and medium term activities that form the bond between public, private sector, civil society in which we can display the quick wins. I think it will be good for the country and it will be good for the investment community. And there are projects that are being proposed to do that. The question is, we need to get hands on deck to do that. 
The point you made is quite interesting regarding the flight of capital. I mean, let's be honest about South Africa. We've built global companies that regionally and globally are successful around the world. The challenge in South Africa is we have a very real responsibility of really working to bring people into this formal economy. We should not discount the challenge that our society has gone through. At the same time, given the world's changes, we now have to change the tire on the car while the car is moving. The question is, is do we have the leadership will between the sectors to really step up to it? What solutions did you come up with? How did we successfully invest in this fourth industrial revolution? It's, uh, it, it was very, very clear. Uh, lifelong learning is no longer an option. It's an obligation. Uh, and it, it literally is um, those who invest in developing and accessing information and reskilling themselves and working for themselves are the ones who will benefit. The societies that that uh, will benefit most, it was uh, comprehensively the, the ones who have the greatest brain power. It's moving from brawn to brain. In the Industrial Revolution, you might have had a lot of low-skill jobs being lost or displaced or temporarily moved around. Um, but with this, it might be not just low-skill, not just semi-skilled, but with things like AI, even medium to high-skill jobs being displaced. And doesn't it make the social democracy that you've seen in Europe far more relevant going forward than it has been in the past? Perhaps, now you're going into the realm of politics, but the reality is a lot of those jobs that you talk about are not going to exist in future. But what I can tell you is Don Tapscott, who's an American, is a Canadian futurist, did a research amongst young people, millennials, less than millennials, younger than millennials, and he, did, he spoke to 10,000 of them. And in his research, he asked them about political governance and political systems. And very much the response was, this is insane. We vote for someone who promises us things they don't deliver, and we give them power for five years. If you look at businesses that have succeeded, it is not because of a political model. These models are working regardless of the political economy. So engaging business, working with what we would call companies that are driving the economy, the question is, is that how do we create an ecosystem in the fourth industrial revolution that is enabling to the participants? Yeah, I think the big issue is uh, conflict versus cooperation. So it's, uh, it's much better to, uh, to try to find, uh, you know, uh, like in the Scandinavian countries, the northern European countries like the Netherlands, uh, Sweden and so on, there's uh, uh, unions and government and business are cooperating. They sit around the table every year, they talk about wage uh, increases that are uh, affordable by, uh, by businesses and how these things will uh, in, be in line with employment creation and so on. So I think that's really important that sometimes we seem to forget the link between wage demands, wage increases and, and unemployment.